China, UVC 2023. I find it hard to believe that the pandemic happened in 2020, but here we are. Starting 2023, and I thought I'd take a look at some of the lamps being sold as germicidal lamps on AliExpress. And we'll start off with these ones, which were clearly never going to be UVC, but that's what they were being passed off as. Let me plug this in. I have no qualms about plugging this one in because I know it's not going to harm me with dangerous UVC energy because it's UVA. Let me turn the light off and you'll see what I mean. See that deep purple? I'll just take the exposure off and it'll swamp out that fantastic colour. I mean, nice colour, but not UVC. Watch your eyes. The light is about to come back. The light is back. Uh, power consumption, 2 watts. I worked out that the current through the LEDs, and there's two parallel circuits, about 48 LEDs, 24 in each circuit. The current through the LEDs is about 15 milliamps, which is okay, that's not going to be too bad. However, this is one of those lamps that has a capacitive dropper, because I've tested onto the connections, and uh, it does pose a slight risk, don't touch the front of the lamp. Uh, incidentally, just for those wondering, this is a dodgy Chinese factory test box with lots of exciting mains 240 volt outlets on things like test probe connections. It's exciting. I just thought I'd mention that in case you've not seen it before. Let's see if we can pop this open and take a look inside it. Is it glued in? It may be glued in. Maybe I should flex it first to try and break some of that glue. Uh, one more. I'm just going to go and actually I'll get the vice of knowledge. That's the best thing to do. We shall squeeze it in the vice of knowledge to impart its inner secrets. Looking through the back of it, I can see there is a capacitive dropper inside it from the back. On the back of the circuit board, which is not uncommon. I don't hear crunchy noises. I, I prefer to hear crunchy noise when I'm squeezing like this. I'm probably just basically splitting all the LEDs off. This one may be about to sacrifice itself for the greater knowledge. I shall try squishing this down underneath. Let's see if I can stab myself in the process. Oh, that is tight. That is a very tight fit. Oh, it's making crunchy noises. Oh, I think this is ordinary circuit board material, but I don't really know. That is not one to come out. It's kind of glued in. Here is the capacitive dropper. Right, tell you what. One moment, I'm just going to reverse engineer this. Actually, I won't bother pausing to reverse engineer. I can see what's in here. Um, we have a 470 nanofarad capacitor, the bridge rectifier. Actually, you know what? I shall pause and I shall draw this down. One moment, please. No surprises whatsoever. Let's zoom in. One nice thing about this. The resistor that is used as a uh, safety discharge resistor across the uh, the dropper capacitor here, uh, this little resistor underneath the red capacitor here, is uh, quite a big resistor. Vis physically, it's quite big. They've not skimped in the resistor sizes as they sometimes do, so it's probably better rated for having a fairly high voltage across it. The purpose of that resistor is just to make sure this capacitor discharges so you don't get a little pop off the pins when you touch them. Uh, so it's got the capacitor which uh, limits the current in each half cycle by allowing a portion through. It's got the bridge rectifier. It's got the smoothing capacitor which is 2.2 microfarad, 400 volts, which is ample enough for this. It's nice that they used 400 volt because it means if the LEDs go open circuit, the capacitor won't vent. It won't gradually build up pressure and pop. Uh, it's got a 1 mega ohm dis discharge resistor across it and also that acts as a slight load to prevent uh, the lamp ghost glowing. Then, rather nice, it's got a 100 ohm resistor in series. It does say 330. Oh, it says, well, 330. It could be 330 ohm, or it could be 330 as the value, the colour code, which would be 33 ohm. In this instance, it's 100 ohm, and then it's got two strings of 24 LEDs to make up the 48 LEDs in this, and they're just wired in parallel with the current shared between them. That also is the advantage that in the event of... Uh, one LED going open circuit, the other half light, as what well, they, they stay lit, but it's not necessarily that great a thing. I'm just going to check here. Are they just wired? They are just wired in tandem parallel. If one goes out, just the other one will take extra duty, but that will be seeing the full current about 30 milliamps, quite high. Okay, okay. Uh, let's bring in the UVC tube now. I'll just zoom back out again. And I'm going to actually power up this UVC tube, and then 
let you see it lit, but I'm not going to expose myself to it too much because this is the real deal. This is UVC that will will hurt MD watching it. So let's stuff these wires into my dangerous electrical connector here. Not actually recommended for use out with China. And I shall uh, pause momentarily while this warms up, making care, being careful not to stick my finger in the end of this because it's got beer live electrical connections in the end of it. As these things tend to do, right, tell you what, I'm just going to turn this on, then pause and walk away. One moment, please. Prepare to behold the curse of UVC tubes. If I turn the light off, it's this absolutely exquisite turquoisey blue. It's very pretty to look at, but don't look at it. Uh, one moment, please. The light is coming back. Watch your eyes. Yeah, let's not leave that running too long. You see that? exquisite colour. We can see a little bead of mercury. Is that a mercury? It's mercury droplets in there. Uh, the exquisite colour is because a mercury discharge uh, has visible spectrums as well as the ultraviolet ones. And the ones we're seeing here are sort of a blue and green spectrum. It gives this lovely turquoisey colour. But unfortunately, if you look at one of these tubes with your naked eyes, i.e. no glasses, no eye protection, I have eye protection, then the more dangerous wavelength that it emits, 254 nanometer, will cause eye irritation. It will give you basically arc flash, what welders experience from the arcs. And that manifests itself as you waking up in the middle of the night with really, really sore eyes. It feels like sand has been thrown into your eyes. Um, the welder's technique for relieving that discomfort, and this may be, people swear by this, I don't know if it works, it's, I'm not giving medical advice here. But welders, when they get it, they slice up a potato with a knife and then they scrape some of the liquid that came from the potato and they drip it into their eyes. I, that doesn't sound nice, but having said that, I've experienced mild ultraviolet uh, eye damage and it does, it feels really itchy and horrible. The other wavelength uh, that these can emit is 184 nanometer that emits ozone. I didn't think this was one of those tubes, but I'm getting a slight whiff of ozone from that brief operation. Um. It's all down to the glass. Traditional fluorescent tubes are based on either, well, usually soda glass, I think, these days. And that blocks the harmful wavelengths. In fact, the 254 nanometer wavelength, the, uh, the invisible wavelength, it uh, is converted to visible light in normal fluorescent tubes by the white phosphor inside. And that's what basically, I mean, it's the bulk of the output isn't 254 nanometer, and that's what makes all the light that stimulating the phosphor. If the glass is even purer still, the quartz or uveal glass, it can also emit 184 nanometers, which uh, breaks apart oxygen molecules and they reform in various complex combinations, but notably ozone, which is three atoms of oxygen in one molecule, short-lived uh, molecule that is a very strong oxidizing effect, and that has a nice pervasive sterilizing effect in the area as well. But the UVC energy in the same way it irritates your eyes and skin will kill bacteria. I'm just going to pull the little plug off then to listen to the tube out. Other things worthy of note. They used to think the UVC was very harmful in the sense that they believed it could cause skin cancer. Now they realize that the wavelength is so short, it doesn't penetrate deep enough in your skin. It will cause major irritation on the surface, but it doesn't penetrate as deep as UVB and UVA, which are much higher risk of doing that. Right, this is going to just be jammed in the end, isn't it? Let's open it up. It is just jammed in the end. I'm going to have to cut wires, am I? Yes, I am. So we've got four wires here, two going to the end for the uh, heater and the and general electrode. And the other end, I would expect the same thing. Right, I'm going to see if I can get the ballast out of this. This is going to require chopping wires. What a shame. Oh, these two lamps from AliExpress cost uh, £3.86, so about £2 each. Not bad for an ultraviolet effect lamp. Uh, this one cost... £4.74 inclusive of shipping, which is actually not too bad. Now, theoretically, I should be able to slide the ballast out. Here it is. It's wrapped in uh, insulating plasticized paper. Where's that? A kniff. And I shall slit this. 
It is. The research has been done saying that the UVA-ish wavelengths, this isn't true UVA, this one, uh, this is what I'd call deep violet. It's around about the 405 nanometer, 395 nanometer. It's a very deep violet color, verging on infrared, uh, an ultraviolet, should I say. And people do kind of classify it as UVA, but it's not totally true that it's UVA. I see a capacitor here. I'm going to discharge that capacitor before I do it unexpectedly through my finger. He said, poking it with a metal screwdriver. It is dead. Right. I think we need to explore this circuit board. Um, right, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take some pictures of this and I'll reverse engineer it. Uh, and I'll be back in a moment. But uh, before I do that, I was saying the UV, they reckon that deep violet can have a mild germicidal effect. But all this research I've seen on it is very vague. And then at the end it says, but it's... May have a mild effect, but it's not considered very strong. They're basically covering their butts for that. Uh, right, tell you what, I'm going to reverse engineer this. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. It's basically the circuitry of a compact fluorescent lamp or a typical electronic ballast. The main supply comes in and there's a bridge rectifier based on four discrete diodes. That then charges up this capacitor to create a fixed DC supply from the main supply that is used to power the circuit. There is an oscillator, a self-oscillating oscillator based on these two transistors and a feedback coil. The feedback coil has three windings on it. It's got the main winding, uh, which the current flowing through the tube goes through this winding, and it's got a little red and a blue winding, and they are used to drive these transistors so that the way it's configured, only one can be on at a time, which is just as well, because they'd effectively short out this main supply, uh, rectify main supply if they did turn on together. There is a inductor, a fairly large chunky inductor at this end. It's got four pins, but two of them are just linked together here. They're just strictly physical support, but it's basically got two connections. It's an inductor and sears the tube to limit the level of current flowing through it. Other things worthy of note, uh, this capacitor here is the in series with the tube, and it effectively, as this oscillates, it charges and discharges that capacitor. I think this will probably determine the amount of current that flows, uh, the amount of power, the power rating of the uh, circuit. And this other capacitor here is between the two ends of the tube to act as a sort of almost like an electronic starter. It bypasses a little bit of current that allows the heaters at the end of the tube to glow. Let me bring in the schematic, because it will probably make a lot more sense if I do. I'll zoom up just a tiny bit more, just to get a bit of extra size. OK, the first stumbling block. It uses MJE13001 transistors. The first I looked up to find the pinout of those transistors Rather than just work it out from the circuit, I looked it up and found lots of pictures with a pinout, but that pinout was wrong. Uh, it turns out that MJE13001 is available with two pinouts. This one is with the flat facing towards you, base collector emitter. It made much more sense after I'd done that. Okay, so here's the bridge rectifier. There's the capacitor. What's the value of that capacitor? That capacitor is... I'm going to guess 10 microfarad, could be wrong. 3.3 microfarad, I was very wrong. 3.3 microfarad, 400 volts. Okay, that's reasonable enough. So there's our DC supply here. One and the positive goes to that capacitor and then through the heaters at each end of each tube via this uh, coupling uh, capacitor here. So here's what happens when the circuit starts up and a lot happens at once, which is just a bit annoying. But that's OK. Initially, when you power it up, current flows through this resistor and this resistor and turns on this transistor here. Notable that uh, there is a capacitor down here to isolate the base of that transistor from the zero volt rail, because otherwise the current would just take a short path to the zero volt rail and it might not turn on the transistor reliably. It's also notable that's an electrolytic capacitor and that the negative isn't connected to zero volts. So the negative is actually connected, the positive side is connected to the negative side of the supply. I'm not quite sure why that is, why they've done that. The orange here indicates this little feedback transformer. So what happens is that when this transistor turns on, the 
current will start flowing because this capacitor is fully discharged. Effectively, the there'll be some current flow through that going through the inductor, through the tube inductor, the little feedback circuit and down to the zero volt rail via this transistor because it's been turned on by that uh, slight current through there. As the current flows, the current flowing through this uh, sense coil induces current in the base of this transistor circuit so that it actually starts to turn that transistor on. That From that little initial start, trickle, it actually turns on to a solid drive to turn that transistor on. Once that capacitor is fully charged effectively, uh, it is uh, the current through this stops, this transistor turns off, the field starts collapsing, and uh, it turns this transistor on via this coil, which is the winding in the opposite direction. And now the charger that's put in that capacitor, because this side was positive, this side is negative, now gets shunted. So it effectively discharges that capacitor. So the whole process of these transistors turning on and off is charging and discharging that capacitor via the inductor to limit the sort of peak current. And then through the tube, that 3.3 nanofarad capacitor just trickles that little bit past that it will result in these uh, giving heat and it just pr protects the electrodes. Also helps start the tube. Anything else worth mentioning here? There is one thing. This resistor here, it's not just providing a slight path of current for that start circuit. This is the most minimalist circuit. This is a very, what you might call, cheap circuit. They normally use a DIAC, uh, an interesting sort of circuit to actually trigger the transistor decisively to start it. This is a very sort of cheap and nasty type circuit, but ultimately maybe just super, well, cheap, and that's why they do it. But it has a capacitor here that it also bridges, and that is presumably a filter, I'm guessing, to try and limit the uh, high frequency noise on here above, you know, the point, very high switching spikes that could potentially uh, cause disturbance in the transistors and make them trigger falsely and uh, resulting in a bit of a bang because that would if they did that basically through these 5.1 ohm resistors that would be a bridge from the positive and negative i don't know it's i'm not quite sure what the purpose of that capacitor is i'm guessing it is for stability of the circuit maybe even it's to control the frequency of oscillation in some way though i thought that would have been done by this inductor and this uh, capacitor here it's quite odd if you have any ideas on that let me know uh, the other thing's worth a note, there's a little diode between the emitter and the base here. I think that's just basically protection against the base, uh, well, being reverse polarity when the uh, coil is, the other coil is being driven. Um, and that's it. It's an interesting little circuit. I have to say, I wouldn't like designing a circuit like this. I remember the early days of compact fluorescent lamps when they literally used to just explode, particularly when they got hot. And you think of it, a lot of them are based around this circuitry, and a lot of them end up baking inside compact fluorescent lamps to the point that the circuit board is all brown and discoloured because they've got so hot, and yet they just keep working. The capacitors are dried out. They just keep working forever. Uh, it's surprising how long some compact fluorescent lamps last. But when they do feel, they usually go with a bit of a bang and blow all the tracks off the circuit board. But very interesting. So that is a, a look at the current state of ultraviolet, both fake ultraviolet and the real UVC. Um, interests here, things are evolving. I'd guess that now the pandemic is past, they're going to be getting rid of a lot of excess stock. But a good thing, I'd say that uh, one good thing that happened during the pandemic is it suddenly gave the incentive to the manufacturers of U well, UVC, real UVC LEDs, not these ones, but the little gold package ones. It actually established the market for those. And it meant the companies making the fluorescent tubes, they suddenly had a really big market. It must have been quite revitalizing to them in a way. But that's it. Quite interesting, worth opening up. Surprising how cheap this little light fitting was with the tube and with the electronic ballast inside it was really really cheap um but then i guess that's just mass production for you it's cheap and easy uh, but nice quite interesting to explore